Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Vince Warren, and welcome to Doing the Right Thing, Working in Public Interest Law, which is a webinar designed for the National Black Law Students Association. We're really glad that you were able to join us. We know that you all are super, super busy, probably more than a little stressed out. Um, but we wanted to provide a webinar that talks specifically about how people can get into public interest law working with a national uh, association, Black Law Students Association. We also wanted to make, to key it up for people of color, for black folks and our allies, which is all of you. So we're glad that you're here. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Center for Constitutional Rights, and I'll be the moderator for this webinar. And uh, we wanna talk with you about a number of pathways to success in public interest law. The Center for Constitutional Rights uh, works tirelessly with people on the ground and the social movement to push back against the most egregious forms of power. And you'll see that from our work by looking at our website, which I hope that you will do. Um, so tonight on the panel, we have wonderful, wonderful people, all staff here at the Center for Constitutional Rights. And uh, first is uh, Omar Farah. Omar is a senior staff attorney here at the Center for Constitutional Rights and is the lead lawyer in Color of Change versus Department of Homeland Security and Federal Bureau of Investigation, which seeks records that reveal the government's expansive surveillance of movement for black lives. Omar focuses on array of CCR's litigation and advocacy in response to abusive policing, counterterrorism practices, including unlawful surveillance of Muslim American communities, the criminalization of dissent, and systemic unlawful policing practice. Next is Chinyere Ezie, who is a staff attorney here, and she advocates for racial and gender justice, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans transgender, queer, and intersex rights, and challenges government abuses of power. Chinyere uh, is the lawyer who brought the fashion company Prada to its knees. You might remember uh, when they had a series of, <laughs> of um, ridiculously racist figurines. Um, she was the first one to publicly challenge this, um, which resulted from them removing it from their stores worldwide. She also spearheaded a groundbreaking amicus brief in the Harris Funeral Homes case, which was just argued before the Supreme Court a few weeks ago. This is the, the case that asks the question as to whether transgender people are covered by Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. Um, her brief elevated the voices of more than 30 transgender people who've experienced workplace discrimination firsthand. Uh, last but certainly not least is Aya Syed. And Aya is a Bertha Justice Fellow here at the Center for Constitutional Rights, where she specializes in challenging unlawful detentions, counter terrorism practices, the criminalization of dissent, uh, and systemic unlawful policing practices. Before joining the Center for Constitutional Rights, Aya worked as a student attorney at the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau, where she provided direct legal representation to tenants facing eviction. So tonight, uh, we're going to discuss three areas. Uh, the first area is how we got into this work and our paths into public interest law. The second area is the challenges we faced as black attorneys specifically. And third is what we wish we had known in law school that would have been helpful to building the career in public interest law. So then we will also then have a question and answer session at the end, but you please do not have to wait until uh, the end of, to send your questions in. Please use the Q&A icon to submit the questions and we will try to incorporate them either at the end or as part of the discussion. So please don't wait. <coughs> I think we can get started. So um, we're going to start with Chinyere, and then we're going to talk with Omar and Aya. And uh, the question is, why did you get into this work? And what was your path? Sure. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I'm very glad to be here, and I'm very excited to talk about my path into public interest law. I um, it's probably helpful to start with why I decided to go to law school. Um, it's probably similar to a lot of you all, but um, I was interested in seeing how the law could serve as a tool to seek justice in communities um, that mattered a lot to me. I had previously worked as a sociologist and a researcher, and what I saw there is that while I had an opportunity to document a lot of the systemic inequalities that um, you know, minorities, people of color face in our society, both here and abroad, that I didn't have um, tools or mechanisms to sort of begin to dismantle that oppression. And so, um, although law, as you probably also know, if you're um, well on your way into law school, 
is a very flawed um, device and flawed tool. I um, was very interested in learning how it could um, be utilized by disempowered communities to sort of seek mm -hmm. justice and demand for justice. And so um, I went to a law school that didn't have the most resources available to public interest students at the time. And so I had a little bit of um, an unconventional path into public interest law. It was again what I wanted to do when I enrolled, but um, there were not a lot of career advising available to me. And so instead what I did is um, I pursued a clerkship for a year and then I accepted a job at a law firm. Um, I chose a law firm, however, that had a lot of pro bono um, as part of its sort of um, vision for the work. And so um, when I was there, I kind of just shamelessly exploited <laughs> that provision. And I think over two years build um, more than a thousand hours of pro bono, <laughs> um, which is to say half of my time That's to pro bono. Um, but what that did, and um, you know, it was give me an, an, a place that I could sort of skill up and become a better, um, more skilled attorney, um, you know, and also sort of be able to craft a next step. And so that next step um, was to a nonprofit organization, Southern, the Southern Poverty Law Center, and I practiced there um, in Alabama, um, which is their, their main office, doing um, LGBT work, um, Q rights work on behalf of Southerners, and um, mostly Southerners who were um, people of color, and um, challenge things like um, prison conditions impacting transgender individuals and um, denial policies that denied them healthcare and um, safety. And more recently, um, I did a stint at the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Um, so that was a role where I was a trial attorney. I um, litigated employment discrimination cases on behalf of employees who brought claims to the commission. <clears throat> And um, I've been very proud to be a member of the Center for Constitutional Rights staff for the past year. So um, when it comes to Q&A, if you have any questions about um, what it's like to practice um, as a, <laughs> a corporate attorney who's uh, stealthily planning their exit <laughs> and exploiting firm resources, or um, someone at a, a big nonprofit or um, you know, federal government or other government, um, I've sort of been able to experience a lot of that. And, I'm very glad that um, I've now made CCR my home. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Omar. As, as Vince said, I've been with the Center for Constitutional Rights now for uh, nearly eight years. And um, it, it's always exciting to be able to talk to people who are uh, who, who know of CCR and are on their way out of uh, law school or, or maybe just getting introduced to our organization for the first time. Um, you know, I had a, a pretty circuitous route to get to, to public interest law. I think it was uh, kind of a process of learning to listen to things that I, I already knew. I had the, you know, the, the experience of growing up in a lot of um, very severely impoverished um, parts of the world, parts of the developing world. I, I grew up uh, in a family where uh, my mother was an educator, my father worked in, in service of refugees. And I think I always had a sense that your professional life should be dedicated to something larger than, than your own interests. It took me a while to sort of figure out how to marry that with my own particular set of, of interests. And so um, I bounced around, uh, you know, I worked in, in corporate America right when I got out of college and, and that was um, uh, as, as miserable an experience as you might've heard it to be. Uh, so much so that I fled to become a teacher myself and uh, was a high school teacher for two years before I, I got to, to law school. Um, at law school, I, I spent a lot of time working and um, and being in community with people who were involved in, in the clinical programs uh, dedicated to politi um, you know, political asylum seekers. And that I think was sort of the first real indication of, of, of a direction that I could go to, uh, that I would go in. Like, like Chunyere, I um, went to a law firm when I got out of uh, law school and and was very intentional about selecting a law firm that had a, a large and robust pro bono program. And most of, um, I think I can, can top you, there was a stretch there where I think I was really full time doing pro bono work at my law firm, yeah, um, litigating habeas cases on behalf of Guantanamo prisoners. And that was, uh, you know, I think um, the, the place where professionally, I think I was, um, radicalized, working, you know, for, for Muslim prisoners at an offshore island prison, torture survivors, 
uh, meeting with folks with, you know, just a, a notepad and a pen and trying to think about how to translate the stories that I was hearing in those cells into legal doctrine and um, in a way that was faithful to their experiences is, is a large part of the way that I have uh, stayed in this work and, and sort of organized my own career trajectory. And I was fortunate enough to be able to actually bring some of the the clients that I've been working with for many years with me to the Center for Constitutional Rights, which is to me an indication of the commitment that this institution has for, for supporting people who are doing um, the kind of work that, that we celebrate and, and center here at, at the organization. Um, but, but by no means was it presumed that I would uh, continue to focus as heavily on that area of the law as I had before. And so in my, my eight years, I've had a breadth of litigation and an advocacy out of court experience on issues from policing to, um, to immigration, a lot of FOIA cases. The, the Center for Constitutional Rights has an open records project which is dedicated to arming activists and organizers with the information they need through the FOIA uh, process to, you know, to build power in the communities that they represent. And so it's been, um, it's been an absolutely uh, exciting and sort of evolving and changing experience for the last eight years. Thank you. Um, looking forward to questions. All right. Uh, hi, family. Uh, my name is Aya. As the newest member of the bunch, I've only been out of law school for about a year. And I have to say, I'm very excited to both engage in the conversation, but also learn from you all. I feel like there's so much wisdom for me as well. Um, and so in terms of how I got into the work, um, I really think for me and a lot of folks, perhaps of my generation, Really, the spark was Trayvon Martin's murder in 2012. Uh, I was in college. I was, I think, a junior at the time. And um, also coming out of the heels of what was then a really robust Occupy Wall Street movement, um, I remember sort of getting together with a bunch of um, folks who were organizing around uh, Black Lives Matter and, and police brutality in Philadelphia and organizing this like massive march of hundreds of people in the city that then ballooned into thousands of people and feeling so outraged and so um, invigorated by the kind of national attention this moment was garnering. Um, and feeling, I think, for the first time really in my life, the, the impact and power a social movement can have. And, um, and, and, and also, I think it's, it's important to be said that it was, um, so much of it was really sparked by social media and the power that technology can have. And so feeling that kind of um, power was, I think, really motivating for me and really informed and shifted the way I thought about uh, my life and my trajectory, because up until then, I really hadn't thought about uh, social movements as a force to be reckoned with, both politically and legally, but more importantly, socially and changing how we're thinking about issues. Um, and, and then shortly thereafter, I think it was the summer of 2013, when George Zimmerman's um, sort of non-indictment or, or uh, this sort of jury finding him non, not guilty was revealed publicly in the sort of theater that everyone was watching at the same time. And I felt so helpless at the time. And, and that was actually the day that I ordered all of my LSAT books. I mean, I had never before thought about law school as um, a tactic or a strategy for me, but I felt as though I would really be doing myself a disservice or, or even that I felt obligated, I think, to equip myself with the necessary tools to at the very least um, protect communities that I was so, um, so deeply ingrained in Rained in and also felt like I had owed so much to. Um, and I think it was also a really crucial moment in that it, it for the first time, demonstrated to me all the sort of continuities um, in my own life, wherein I saw the ways in which the law and policing and surveillance were really coming up against uh, personal lived experiences um, in a way that I had just never before. And so that really, um, uh, I think, um, in a way obligated me to pursue a career in law. And since then, I think um, that the sort of only, um, uh, the only lens through which I engaged in law school was through this thought or through this commitment to resistance and, and, and really revolutionary thinking. Um, and so during law school, I not only, you know, sort of made it a point to um, participate in clinics, but also was deeply involved in student protest movements um, and sit-ins and occupies across, across campus. And that's sort of the, the energy and, and 
um, the commitment I hope to bring in future pursuits. That's awesome. And you know, th th this tension, and I, maybe people are feeling this as well, that like there's sometimes a tension between what got you in motivated to go to law school and what's the kind of mm. work that's available for to you in law school and out of law school, which I think we should touch on. We have a couple of interesting questions, which um, some people have really clear questions about pro bono work in law firms. So one was to Tignere, which is, uh, Tignere, excuse me. Um, how many pro bono hours are good to work before planning to leave corporate law? Is there a minimum recommended? Um, that's a rule follower <laughs> right there. Um, and the other one is, um, did any of you partner with the Center for Constitutional Rights on lawsuits while doing pro bono work in law firms? And even if you didn't, um, did you partner with other social justice organizations? Sure. Um, since one of those questions were, was directed to me, I'll um, dive in. I think I can answer both. Um, so my path to CCR um, had a 10 year break, but I did intern um, at the Center for Constitutional Rights back when I was in law school. And I did it during a semester. So um, I want to make that uh, something that all of you are aware of that in addition to internships that you do over the summers. Um, you also have an opportunity to sort of do term time projects, fall, winter, even winter break. Um, so think about that as something that um, kind of expands your reach. Um, it was something that, you know, um, really gave me a flavor for the work here and the, the environment. And I'm very glad to say 10 years later, I was able to join full time. Um, as for um, <clears throat> the question about pro bono at a law firm, I want to give um, two reactions to that. One is um, when you're evaluating law firms to consider whether you go, go to them as someone that really is public interest minded, make sure that you're looking for um, law firms that do not cap the number of pro bono hours that you can apply towards your billable requirement. Um, now, not all law firms are transparent about having a billable requirement, although in my experience, it tends to hover around um, 2,000 hours a year, whether that's stated or unstated. But there are some law firms that will say you can apply 50 hours of pro bono to your billable hours. And that might, in the abstract, sound generous. But what that means is after you do those 50 hours, you're going to face a mountain of pressure to redirect your energies back to billable work. Um, and so the, the law firm that I chose to go to had no billable, had no cap, again, on pro bono hours, which is why um, I was able to run up uh, my hours. And um, what having a really, um, I mean, my answer to that beyond that, um, if you if you know that you're planning to leave the law firm um, and that your goal is not to make partner, I think, you know, the more hours, the better um, for two reasons. One is that it really can give you an opportunity to gain skills that you would not have in your billable work. Um, you know, I'm a litigator through and through, so I'm speaking with that perspective. But um, in my pro bono practice at the law firm, I was able to write briefs from start to finish, right? I was able to take depositions. And these are, are things that are very um, kind of scarcely um, divvied up when you are in a billable practice, oftentimes just reserved for the partners. So I was getting incredible skills that um, people who only did billable work might not have five or six years into their time at a law firm um, in my first year or two there because um, my law firm viewed pro bono as something that, for better or for worse, allowed lawyers to sort of gain some practical experience. And so I think doing more pro bono hours will have the first benefit of just enhancing your own professional development relative to any other work that you might be touching at a law firm, because it'll likely be more substantive. And frankly, you might care a lot more about it, which for me um, really enhances my learning experience. But in addition, because I was able to do so much pro bono, I was also able to establish relationships and really build a docket that spoke to my enduring commitment to social justice work, even though I was at a law firm. Because, you know, to be transparent, there are some organizations that will question why you spent time at a law firm when you're trying to apply for a public interest job. And I think it really was the fact that I was able to do so much of it that enabled me to make that transition really seamlessly. No one uh, questioned my commitments to the work. Thank you. So um, Omar, just real quickly, um, you mentioned this in your uh, comments, but the relationship of the Guantanamo work, and for those of you who don't know, for the last 18 years, there have been uh, men detained without charge in the Guantanamo military base uh, in Cuba, um, that this government has not allowed uh, those folks to go to trial um, or 
and it's and there are a number of them that they're not releasing. It's really one of the biggest uh, human rights crises of our time, which Omar and CCR have worked on, which is the relationship of your Guantanamo work at the firm to CCR. Quickly. Yeah, one, one of the things that I, I think will just be an enduring uh, success of the Center for Constitutional Rights has been to organize uh, what some will call the, you know, the largest sort of mass defense effort um, in sort of like modern legal history, which was to, to, to get folks to actually take on the commitment, including, including a lot of law firms, to take on the commitment of representing the men at Guantanamo. And so I, I certainly did have um, fairly regular interactions with people who were on staff at CCR while I was working on a law firm doing Guantanamo um, cases. And, and, and that was part of what, you know, made me understand just how dynamic the work at CCR can be. If, if what is, some of what I hear in that question lurking is, um, is there a, a, you know, a cohort of people who are connected to CCR who then find their way into the organization? And I, and I, I, I it's important to say that, you know, CCR uh, works really hard to ensure that people who are not connected to us and who have disparate experiences doing social justice work are, are sort of identified and, and, um, and, and brought in when, when all the other circumstances are correct. So. Yeah, I would add to that, just I want to move to um, Aya and the next question, is that um, your ability to chart your course towards justice is really the determinative factor. It is very easy to get caught up in direct services, in law firms, in private uh, uh, law, law situations where you're learning so much and doing so much um, that you can lose sight of the place that you're trying to get. There's always a way to make it work. Uh, you have to be smart about it and you also have to be pushing, I think, both your organization and your practice towards um, the justice that many of you sought when you went into law school. So on that quick question before we throw to uh, Aya, this is a uh, speed date real talk <laughs> session and the question is, um, should I, if there is no pro bono requirement that is publicly articulated, should I ask them uh, in an interview, yes or no, for, for a law firm? If you're applying to a law firm, you're in a job interview, and they don't say anything about the number of hours that are required, should you ask what is the required hours? I have an answer for this. I have, um, yeah, yeah. So most law firms um, will have at least a two-step interview process. So. Um, there's one interview where they are screening you, and typically, um, once you have an offer, which might be after one round, might be after two rounds, you have an opportunity to come back and sort of ask them questions. So I think it is a great question to ask when you have an offer in hand. Um, you know, my emphasis is on stealthily doing lots of pro bono. I did think it was helpful to sort of um, conceal my strong interest in leaving the firm and billing lots and lots of hours of pro bono along the way. Um, during the interview process, but um, be sure to check Vault and there's some other services, right, that um, actually give you a lot of detailed information about law firms. And so when I was applying, I actually just made a list from Vault looking at the firms that did not have a pro bono cap. So I do think that information might be available, if not on the firm website and other databases that are accessible to law students. Thank you, firm people, for the firm questions. We're going to talk about black folks now. Um, I, uh, <laughs> My friend, uh, we're going to start with you, then go to Chinyere and Omar. Um, you know, what types of challenges, you know, in any context have you faced or do you continue to face as a black attorney? I think I had this assumption coming out of law school that if I was able to sort of um, isolate myself from certain corporate spaces, um, sort of once I get this degree that it would immune me from facing anti-blackness, especially in the non, uh, in the public interest sort of nonprofit space. And the reality of the matter is that no place is immune from anti-blackness, no matter what organization I think you're in. And so um, just being honest about and transparent and thoughtful about the facts that you know, no matter what space you're going to be entering, um, it will be challenging. And, and just because you're going into a well-intentioned um, sort of space doesn't mean that there won't be challenges for you as a Black attorney. Um, but then thinking really intentionally about um, the kinds of spaces that you'll be in and making sure that um, you have folks who you can rely on, who you can sort of talk to, I think becomes really crucial. But just because you have an Esquire and next to your name does not mean that you are now you know, sort of immune from it all. 
Yeah, I'm going to add on to what Aya said. Um, I think that for me, I would describe the challenges I faced as a Black attorney as twofold. One is um, probably to be anticipated, and that is people um, questioning my expertise and my credentials. Um, one very recent example, um, I was able to go to the Supreme Court to attend the argument in the LGBT employment discrimination cases that I'd worked on as an amicus. And um, I was asked uh, whether I was a Supreme Court admitted attorney, not once, not twice, but on three occasions. And so finally the last time um, I say, hey, I noticed you're not asking anyone else who's in a suit trying to go into this courtroom, whether they are actually an attorney. And um, the security guard got very flustered and tried to, you know, back down. But, you know, I have eyes and I had and ears and I'd literally not seen anyone else sort of be scrutinized in the way that my black body was. And so I think that appreciating that um, when it comes to sort of <clears throat> the expertise, the, your perception of expertise, that um, you will be both racialized and gendered in ways that are really surprising um, or, or maybe to be fully expected. But I, I'll say even with respect to gender, I've been um, disappointed at how regressive the law, <clears throat> um, the legal field can be. And I've literally been in situations where I've had to ask male colleagues to repeat statements I've made because only then will they actually be kind of acknowledged as having been stated and credited as being good ideas. And, um, you know, as someone who experiences my racial identity um, a lot more frequently, that was kind of a surprise. But what I want to also flag um, as like a really important lesson learned is that you um, cannot successfully over many, many years at least, um, and should not try to respond to anti-blackness in the legal perfection, profession by adopting a sort of obsessive perfectionism. Mm -hmm. That was really sort of how I responded to it initially, trying to, as I'm sure many all heard growing up, work twice as hard, um, you know, be the best, you know, no excuses. And the reality is you will <laughs> burn yourself out and your black excellence cannot on its own topple white supremacy. So y'all got to sleep, <laughs> get some sleep, uh, go to yoga, take care of yourself and just do the work because as long as you're passionate about it, you will do it in a way that's exceptional and just appreciate that not only do you not have to prove yourself to anyone, it's never going to work. The, the measure is always going to move. So don't even um, get yourself in that mindset that you have to prove your worth to all your white bosses or else. Because again, the, the, bar, um, the bar is always moving. Yeah, I, I, um, uh, Junetta's story reminds me of um, a trip that I made to, to Guantanamo to see a client of mine who, who had asked in advance of that trip that I print out all of the, the bios from the website so he could see who are the people who are, who are there in New York working on his behalf. And as I was going through my, my ritual check of my legal papers and, and pat down before I entered the cell, the, the military guard would you know, look through all the papers and he got to my, my bio and asked me, now, now which detainee is this? Mm. Um, which, you know, in some ways, is uh, of course surprising, but then I, I think as you were just describing, you know, not surprising at all. And, and the reason I say that is one, just to sort of uh, re-up, you know, Aya and, and Chinede's comment that of course there, there's no escaping anti-blackness. You don't need a webinar to, to tell you that. And, and the challenges of being a black attorney, I think are largely the challenges of just being black. But at the same time, I, I think one of the particular challenges that you'll face if you work in social justice and service of communities that you come from is the challenge of standing at the intersection of your own identity and the kind of uh, excesses and abuses of power and injustice that you wanna fight again. And operating as a lawyer in those spaces oftentimes doesn't give you the latitude to speak as freely uh, mm -hmm. and, and as directly about, about truth and justice and racism and oppression as you might like to, right? There's, there is not the amount of space that there should be in our profession for for righteous anger and, and indignation about some of the things that we that we face. What is really, really exciting about working at the Center for Constitutional Rights is that that is alive and well in our discourse about how we approach our work and what we do. I will continue, I think, as long as I do this work to struggle with the times when we're in specific legal settings where we have to act in roles that, that actually don't 
create space for that. And you will find yourselves at times, and, and I know all of us here share this, being in a courtroom, wanting to, wanting to talk about injustice in a way that reflects the lived experience and having to do a little bit of that depth work to make a system that is hostile to those notions come to terms with them without being, um, um, uh, w without having your opportunity to persuade close before you get started. Can Which I might be an eloquent yeah. way of saying you can't uh, yell about the man, white supremacy, and heteropatriarchy when you're, uh, and those words when you're in court. <laughs> but, I find that a struggle. <laughs> it is a struggle. I was just going to add that I think, um, you know, in this space, we're sort of molded professionally to think of ourselves as advocates on behalf of our patients. And, or, or of our plaintiffs, sorry. And I think that, um, you know, one thing that I am learning um, very early on is the importance of also being an advocate for myself and being prepared to um, adequately, effectively, but also thoughtfully um, advocate for my needs and my sort of professional goals and personal goals um, in professional spaces, which, you know, I'm sure I'll undoubtedly have to do for the rest of my life. But just thinking of yourself also as someone um, worth advocating for, I think is really crucial at this stage. I totally agree. And, you know, from my perspective, <clears throat> um, I worked in uh, as a public defender for uh, a number of years before I did a clerkship. And then I went to the ACLU to do uh, impact litigation. And then I came to CCR. And in the, as, as a public defender working day in and day out in the courtrooms, I had the exact same experience of uh, when you go into the well, only the lawyers are inside, allowed inside the well, and the only time the, the defendants or the clients can come in is if with their lawyer. So when I walk in, I would always get the, hey, 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 you know, and I would have to say, no, bro, I'm a lawyer. And, you know, you have to say it enough times so that they begin to recognize it before you can start complaining to their captain. But it would happen on a daily. And if you talk to people in, in, that do this kind of work now, they will tell you that that still happens. Um, to mm -hmm. this day and which is which gets to this question of the intersection not even the intersection but being at that point where you are both the uh the entity that can create change for your clients particularly when the systems of oppression are um, up, upon them but you're also a symbol mm -hmm. of um and, and and actually are connected and thought of in the same way as your client with respect to the power structure and my thing is just to to plus one, what Chinyere said, is that the idea is not to separate yourself and your privilege as a lawyer from your client. Maybe transactionally, you need to do it to get to, get to, to argue the case, but you don't want to signal to your client that I'm that much better than you because I went to law school and wore a suit. So, you know, and so that's part of the challenge, I think, of, and not just being a lawyer of color or a black lawyer, this is part of the challenge with people who come from communities and identify with communities that are uh, being represented in who they represent. Um, I also, there's some questions here about um, uh, how we get into oh, direct services versus impact litigation. So I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit about that. Particularly, there's one person whose heart is in direct advocacy, but they see the value of doing impact litigation. Would love to hear any experiences or advice about how to wed the two or to, to bring the two together during the career. Um, the other thing, which is I think it's a good topic to talk about now, is how do you actually maintain your dedication to public service, to doing this type of work? How do you stay true to yourself um, and your reasons? How do you do it for, for going to law school? One of you want to take that first? I can, I can talk about the, uh, why don't I start with the, the dedication piece? You know, I, I think um, this is what's, you know, what's exciting about having these kinds of conversations. It forces you to reflect on parts of the work that uh, we don't always get to engage with on a, on a daily basis. I, you know, at least one of the ways that I maintain my dedication, and at times when things have been particularly challenging for me personally to, to continue um, fighting some of the challenges that we, that we tackle here at the Center for Constitutional Rights, is really the, the people and the movements that that we represent and I, you know that sounds maybe that sounds cliched but uh, I have consistently been surprised by the, the humanity the dignity the humor the perspective of of clients that I have worked with who have been in in, in really the, the the darkest of of human circumstances right people who are at the very tip of of the way power uh, and abuse functions in our society, and to have to have people in that position 
um, care for me as, as an advocate, um, to show compassion, uh, to lend me some of their perspective, and to, uh, to have a perspective on, on what success can mean in a, in a legal environment that oftentimes doesn't really value the, um, you know, the remedies that our clients and our movements and the sense of justice that our clients and movements envision for themselves has been just sort of like a consistent touchstone that I've come back to uh, as, I, as I, I do this work. And it is, it's worth acknowledging that, and I, and I appreciate whoever is behind this question, this is really, really hard. And so, you know, as much as you're asking yourself, how do I get into this field? You really do need to ask yourself, you know, why? Keep coming back to that question, why? And keep thinking about what it'll take from you because it is, it, it's, a, it, it's a hard thing to do. Yeah, I mean, even though I think I'm too young in the game <laughs> to be experiencing burnout, there have definitely been moments where, um, you know, it, it sort of takes a toll on you physically doing this work consistently. But I think for me, building off what Omar said, um, what I would add is just working particularly with youth and, and young people, yeah. emerging adults and teenagers really um, invigorates me in ways that I, I don't think I can even begin to articulate, but um, working in particular, um, you know, I spend a good portion of my time outside of work working with uh, Black Muslim youth uh, between the ages of 17 to 22. Um, and the kind of vocabulary and the imaginative sort of spirit that they bring <clears throat> into this work is so refreshing um, that I oftentimes just feel replenished coming back into the work and doing the sort of more mundane task of figuring out how to file a PI motion or whatever it may be. Um, and so being around that energy is definitely a, a, a breath of fresh air and recognizing the kind of uh, impact this work has is, is also very crucial. Um, I'll touch on the first question just a little bit though. Um, again, I think um, it's, it's, it's a bit hard because I'm also trying to navigate that space myself. What I will say is in law school, um, I worked almost exclusively um, uh, directly with patients representing them in housing court um, and felt really passionate about the work and, and had a really hard time um, sort of uh, uh, marrying that experience with um, what I thought was my passion, which was impact litigation um, in the sort of national security space. But there are two things I think that I sort of learned from that experience. One is that they're really, the two options aren't as I think bifurcated as a lot of law students um, or the legal environment or profession would like us to believe in that um, I have tons of friends who uh, worked at, for example, the Bronx Defenders for two or three years and are now in their impact litigation space and their impact litigation team, which is uh, very vibrant. And, and I know folks sort of transition between both roles um, frequently. The other is that I think um, sort of direct client experience informs the way in which you are thinking about some of the legal theories um, when uh, sort of creating and implementing um, and strategizing around um, sort of impact litigation um, uh, tactics. And so I would really, you know, I think it's actually very helpful and, and, and um, um, informative for folks who do have that sort of yearning desire to pursue it, understanding that it's very likely and, and actually probable that you'll be able to uh, figure, figure out how to sort of marry that with an impact litigation career in the future. I don't think you'll, um, you'll foreclose or close any doors uh, for the future. Yeah, this, uh, we're, the, the, thank you so much. The questions are really coming in now and uh, we're going to have to sort of begin to move on. I did want to address one and then throw one out for a, a quick take. Uh, one I wanted to address is that someone mentioned that uh, professors of theirs said that she wished that she had worked in a corporate job before entering the public interest because the public interest jobs typically don't have funds or provide in-house or outside training and what's the thoughts on the advice. Um, I think what your professor or people that think that way are, are saying is that they would like to have and maybe be in organizations that do think about training, uh, public interest organizations that do think about um, how, to, how to train up and to think strategically and equip people with the tools. And like with anything else, it depends on your organization. There are some nonprofit organizations that have zero money and they're bringing you in because you are going to be helping them with a legal strategy and you just have to figure it out. There are other organizations like, like our Center for Constitutional Rights where we invest pretty deeply in training and, um, and, and things like that. So the uh, Bertha Justice Fellowship that 
Aya has is one in which we incorporate a lot of training on a range of hard litigation skills as well as political education and things like that. Uh, and we do it with our Ella Baker summer internship program, which I'll tell you about afterwards. But the answer is no, that is not uniformly true and that you can get a set of skills and trainings through a variety of things. For example, um, there are trainings um, in the National uh, Bar Association with the National uh, Lawyers Guild, with the National Conference of Black Lawyers, and through the networks that you build. It's one of those things where you figure out how to do things together. Um, so my view would not be not to take that advice and just go for, to some place for training, because you're also going to get trained on different things. You'll get trained on how to represent corporate interests in, in a corporate law job. You will not get necessarily trained or certainly not in the right way on how to interview and talk with clients, which is a whole different thing. Can I add to that? Absolutely. Because um, I, I was told the exact same thing, um, and I actually think it's ludicrous now that I've been out for a year. Um, and I thought everyone would sort of told me that this would be lawyer boot camp, that this is where you needed to go to equip yourself with all the necessary skills. Um, but actually a year out, I'm comparing my experience with what some of my peers and colleagues have been doing at a firm. And I'm almost shocked at the lack of experience that they're, they've sort of had um, substantively. I mean, even in the one year I've been asked to, you know, help with depositions, like go to court, I've been asked to argue things. I mean, I couldn't, but you know, that's a whole other story. Um, really played critical roles in helping to write briefs. I mean, there's, because we are um, a fast paced team and there are a lot of things happening simultaneously. You sort of, um, just by virtue of being in this space, have to really operate as, as a, a full time attorney, um, which is challenging in a lot of ways, but really why you know, we went to law school, you're really sort of doing the work. Um, and so not only is it about what kinds of experiences, it's also about the frequency and the depth of the experiences that you're getting. Um, and then just secondly, um, you know, as Vince is saying, there are a lot of uh, public interest positions that are, um, you know, they sort of treat you like you know, any other attorney when in reality folks at this stage really require um, a lot more support. And so I would really encourage folks to look at specific fellowships that um, are not only institutionalized and structured, but at the very least have experience taking in um, fellows and have a kind of program um, to support fellows with their particular sort of professional needs. Thank you. So um, the last question um, that we're going to ask is, uh, what are some of the things that you wish you had known in law school? But before I get to that, I'm going to ask a really hard question, which was posed, and it's a very, very good question, an important one, which is, how do you navigate problematic conversations with white allies? And, in, <laughs> and particularly, um, as an example, um, when you have a uh, white folks or, or non-black folks of color, that they assume that they're engaging in public service or social justice, um, that they understand everything about race. Like how does, how have you dealt with that question of having to recalibrate people's um, expectations and ownership over the, the work, um, but also be clear with, uh, you know, what it means to be black in the work and what black or of color understanding of the work is and how that might be different? Um, I can start. Oh. Um, I think one thing I'm learning is to be explicit about clearly defined roles for various members of um, a team, especially when doing movement work. And one particular example that comes to mind is when we were organizing um, our January, January 11th um, uh, sort of uh, protests that we help to organize annually, um, de demanding for the close of Guantanamo. Um, you know, I remember there being a conversation with some of our white allies around what folks were comfortable doing um, in terms of, you know, putting on, um, you know, an orange jumpsuit and, and, and um, you know, uh, organizing hunger strikes and the like. And um, I was, I, you know, I was very explicit about the fact that I thought our white allies should be doing that work and really putting their bodies at the forefront of the movement and um, and then allowing and freeing up capacity for other folks to really be doing some of the strategizing and thinking about how to expand movements um, and coalitions in the work. Um, and I think that that being honest and, and, um, and explicit about what folks' roles should be um, is one way that I've learned to, to 
handle that and, and also demanding more of, um, of white allies and the like in, in the work. Thank you. Yeah, my, my experience I think is, is more often that than, than the reverse in the sense that, uh, you know, there, there, is, there can be a presumption in social justice legal spaces that, that the attorney who is ethnically or, or identifies in some way with the client population should be the one to do the, the work of being the bridge between the legal strategy and, and the community. And so that to me is sort of where there, there is sort of a persistent built-in bias. And I, I think um, it's worth being really direct about, about that to the extent that you feel uh, capable. Um, I, I think also, you know, there's, there's, you have to lean into your particular expertise and you know, you, you will hear in social justice spaces, I think, a lot of, of, of vocabulary around uh, impacted communities being in charge of their own destiny and, and it should be the one that the lawyers take the lead from. That's sort of a mantra I think folks know. Um, but I think being really specific about what, what that actually means, right? It's not just a matter of understanding their suffering. It's also about actually being like materially in a better place to define what justice looks like, what those remedies look like, and how to actually get there. There's real expertise in that. And uh, that is uh, something that I think, you, you know, as a, as a black attorney, as a Muslim attorney, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm often reinforcing that in, in spaces. I'm not gonna offer um, particularly reassuring advice, um, but step one, lower expectations. Um, <laughs> step two, um, <laughs> Try to see if you can get the get uh, white fragility by Robin D'Angelo on their reading list. And three, um, learn about <clears throat> what the EEOC says about retaliation. Um, I feel like white fragility mm. in uh, white-led organizations can really kind of be the nuclear option. And sometimes um, leaders are really unwilling to sort of reassess um, their role. I, when I was at the EEOC, um, the number one type of um, complaint I would receive from nonprofit organizations mm -hmm. were retaliation claims where a minority employee basically said some, someone, something or someone was racist and suddenly, you know, they are being advised of the, the life that awaits them outside the organization. Mm -hmm. um, which probably brings me to my last point, uh, which is work at a POC-led organization like mm -hmm. CCR. <laughs> um, thank you. And I also, I want to just add to that, which is um, that, you know, just to be clear, we at the Center for Constitutional work, Rights work really hard on all of these questions, and we don't have them all figured out. And we do have hard conversations with each other. And we do have these really important points, I think, not just with uh, external colleagues, but also with internal colleagues about how issues should be framed, how we should be talking about this, what language we should be using. Um, very often in the law and in social justice where people get really focused on the goal and they think that and there is a strategy that says you tell the decision makers what they need to hear in order to move your way but sometimes what decision makers need to hear or are comfortable hearing mm -hmm. even if they go your way it can set us back it can it can make you feel terrible in your skin at the at the way that the argument is being played out at the way that the judge talks about it the way your colleagues are very excited about that's the smart strategy so being able to have those conversations and being clear um, from your perspective um, as a person of color or, or someone that is connected to the community uh, is really important. And the shift is that you're not just offering an opinion, you're offering strategy. And that's what people don't always see. They think, oh, it's just your opinion, but it's actually a strategy um, when you're centering folks of color in uh, discrimination cases. It's a strategy when you're centering undocumented folks or queer folks in the strategy dealing with those issues. And it's not easy to do in a legal framework. It's hard to do personally with your friends, um, but that's the work, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanna talk about, um, so what's the stuff that you know now that you didn't know then that you wish you did that you could tell these folks that they're thinking about because they don't know either? <laughs> Um, I, I'm still carrying the a point that uh, Chunyeda made earlier about uh, the, the the cost that attorneys of, of, of color and other um, you know historically targeted and disfavored identities carry in working in the legal profession, feeling that perfection is the only 
the only sort of way of, of approaching it. And, and you know what's particularly damaging about that I think is that so much success so much of success in in our profession is risk taking mm -hmm. and and I think to be to be you know successful advocate to be uh, you know a zealous advocate on behalf of social movements and clients who are by virtue of their position making very daring arguments and operating in legal spaces where where the courts and our legal system are not actually set up at all to advance their interests it, it requires you to take some risk to be creative and be aggressive and so I, I wish I had a little bit more of awareness of how much that is the measure of, of success and good lawyering um, you know I think networking I'm, I'm just not at all a natural networker I don't you know it, it was hard for me to sort of reach out but I, I think it's just an indispensable piece of it and so in whatever way that you can do that that feels natural and consistent with your identity and personality reach out to people ask questions and and put yourself in positions to find out the things that you that you don't know and then you know legal work is collaborative I think law school um, I think success in law school is in certain ways really at odds with what success in lawyering can can look like uh, we work in teams uh, we have to share work in various stages of, of completion. We've got to ask ideas about, about strategies that aren't particularly well formulated yet. We have to be able to do that. And so uh, get comfortable in that, in that as early as you can in your career, because again, I think that's the kind of thing that sort of catapults you forward. Mm -hmm. um, one, one thing I did, but I, everybody told me not to do, so I'm gonna break the rules a little bit, um, is to really engage with uh, conversations around social justice that are happening on campus and, and being authentic in those conversations. Everyone told me not to do it because the focus should be on your intellectual pursuits and in mastering the law. Um, but what I'm realizing more and more is um, um, that, you know, that there's a sort of implied you're not, um, you know, if you split your time, then you're just not going to be as good of a lawyer, um, which is really, I think, false. And but more importantly, now that I'm um, in this space, I'm recognizing just how crucial some of those conversations that I had in law school were and how I'm carrying those in the work that I'm doing and how so many of the people I was in conversation with are really still um, not only folks that I'm working with professionally, but folks I hope to build a new future with um, moving forward. So, um, you know, don't don't worry so much about um, feeling as though you have such limited time and, and all of it needs to be devoted to classwork. Um, the other two really quick um, pieces of advice. One is just take your internships really seriously. I think after a really grueling year of academic work, if you know, it's natural to think the summer is a time to relax and to just be shadowing and learning. And even though all of that is true, um, the, the sort of relationships that you build over the summer and the kinds of work that you produce over the summer is really going to be what um, helps you transition out of law school. So just be very thoughtful about that. Um, and then finally, a lot of the stuff they tell you matters really doesn't matter as much yeah. you know the, the sort of you have to apply for a clerkship right then and there it's not true really a lot of people apply for clerkships well after they graduate law school um, or that you have to join law review I think if you join a journal and are really passionate about it that's good enough um, so just be true to sort of who you are and, and where your passions are and trust that the same instincts that got you to law school are going to get you out and in, in, in the future <coughs> um, here are mine um, one the most successful law students figure out how to have some chill. Um, same with uh, bar takers. I feel like um, you're going to pass the bar as long as you don't literally have an anxiety attack and pass out. So <coughs> trust yourself, trust the process. Don't let um, perfectionism and anxiety um, derail you off course. It's not to say don't put in the work. Just try to put in the work and leave the anxiety out of it. Um, another thing that I wish I'd known was how valuable it is to um, consider careers in direct service. I think that was really the missing piece at my law school that um, made so mi so few of us actually <coughs> embark on um, careers in public interest right after law school because um, legal aid jobs, um, jobs at um, you know defenders offices, those tend to be more readily available than your plum um, impact job. And when I was at the EOC as a trial attorney, <coughs> The only people I knew who had ever had trial experience were those, that cadre of um, yeah. 
defenders, public defenders, people have been working at state agencies, um, and they were the ones that helped me get ready for my four week uh, trial, jury trial. So um, just appreciating that, um, just like Aya had shared, like that is an arena where you are getting all the professional development and you will use those skills um, throughout your life. Um, you know, and learning how to sort of be a good oral advocate is not something that um, many other pathways in the law will really set you up to do. So see that as um, really additive and again, a way to sort of both get training and experience and demonstrate your commitment to public interest right away. And then I'm not sure if I had a third one, but I do want to um, emphasize again that um, centering yourself in this process and, and um, thinking about self-care <coughs> is important. Oh, here's my third. I guess that's the fourth now. Um, realize now before you're um, extremely disappointed as a as a adult or mid thirty year old that um, a um, learning is a lifetime process and b um, your law school your college education um, even if you went to HBCU might well not have told you all the things you need to know about the law and inequality and how um, these systems have often worked in cohorts rather than um, you know, intention. And so, for instance, I took constitutional law, graduated you know, um, from my law school, and had never learned about convict leasing, had never learned about how the 13th Amendment um, makes slavery constitutional for anyone convicted of a crime. You know? And I think that's a friggin' shame, but um, it's just to say right now, you know, get out a pen and paper and put um, you know, put the new Jim Crow on your reading list, put um, White Rage by Carol Anderson. It explains meticulously how every time we've gotten some rights, there's basically been, you know, what we're experiencing now is Trumpism, you know, in response. And, you know, it, it really kind of helped orient me, although admittedly years later, well after I got my JD, into what we're really facing um, as a progressive <coughs> legal community. And I think it also encouraged me to think about, um, justice is something that doesn't just, uh, you know, we don't just arc towards it, we have to really sort of push and pull an elbow, and we're going to lose along the way, but at the very least, we'll be able to say we're on the right side of history. And that's how I also get my motivation in times where, you know, I'm looking at all the buffoons on the Supreme Court and feeling really uh, bummed out. Totally. And I would add, right before we close, uh, there are three things that I've learned, um, and it's been probably 30 years since I've been in law school. So uh, thing number one, and y'all have to be <laughs> writing this down. Thing number one is that your first job out of law school in no way defines your career in law. So just let that go. Your first job is your first job. And sometimes it's your dream job and sometimes it's a stepping stone. You need to have a strategy, you need to talk to folks, but it is not defining. So you can go into uh, direct services and end up doing Supreme Court arguments. You can uh, go into insurance defense and switch up and end up in direct services. These things are possible. Um, the second thing that I would say that I think is important is that your network, the people that you are connecting to in this work, are as important, if not more important, than your ability to find out about jobs. Uh, in the public interest sector, and particularly in the justice field, it is that, that we have so many applications and what becomes a defining feature is, has this person does, done this work before? Even if they haven't done this work, um, are they moving into this work uh, because they haven't had the economic opportunity to work in, you know, for nothing for a long time? Um, and if they are, you know, and, and, and so looking at those things are really important and the networks are really key. So if you're at a law firm and working with pro bono, spend some time going to the uh, organizations that you're doing the pro bono, go to their events, give them a little bit of money, meet some of the people. Um, if you're working in um, one field and there's a uh, Black Lives Matter chapter <coughs> or National Conference of Black Lawyers or BALSA alumni group, stay connected on the social justice side because these are the people, as I have said, that you end up working with uh, for the rest of your career. And can I just clarify, because networking, like Omar, is a word that kind of terrifies me, but I've come to see that I do it quite naturally when I think about it in the following way, which is just be your authentic self, be affable, you know, and don't like literally just sit in your house all day and not speak to anyone, you know? If you are, I mean, I got my Southern Poverty Law Center job because at the Center for Const or at my law firm, there were people who were partnering with them on pro bono who I was friendly with. And when I applied, they literally forwarded my application 
um, you know, to the hiring uh, manager, right? And when I had a clerkship, I remember that one of the people who I, I got an interview with the judge where someone I did an internship with over the summer also happened to be clerking. What did I do? Did I like ask for any special dispensations? No, I just said like, good morning and like maybe had lunch with them once, you know? So just see it as a way of just, um, again, being your like your full self and appreciating that when you kind of invest in relationships, even just casually, not in a way that feels um, like you're, you're transactional, that it can benefit you um, tremendously down the road. Thank you. And so I'm going to close this out. Um, I want to thank uh, Kinyere and Omar and Aya for a really great discussion today. I hope you enjoyed it. Thing number one, if you liked it and would like, there are many questions that remain unanswered because we're out of time. If you think there are further conversations to have, particularly on right, white fragility, which is popping up on the questions right now. Um, we'll talk to the um, the Balsa folks, and we, you know, we're happy to, to partner with North, Northeast Regional Balsa, and we'll do another one and invite your friends and your people. Um, what somebody asked a question about one L's and particularly what one L's can do as opposed to two L's. So here's some of the things. Number one is the Ella Baker <coughs> Student Internship Program, which the Center for Constitutional Rights does every year. Um, Aya was a, both an Ella Baker intern as well as a Bertha Justice Fellows, which is a two-year fellowship that we do every two years for people that are zero to three years out of law school. And you can find out all of those things by looking on our website, which is ccrjustice.org. Um, I also happen to have been an Ella Baker intern back in the you know 1800s. It was really quite astounding. Um, but please. Tell your people about us. If you don't know about us, learn, hit the website. If you do know about us, um, apply, come work with us. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram at CCR Justice, at, on Twitter at The CCR, on Facebook under Center for Constitutional Rights. And we have a dope podcast called The Activist Files, which you must immediately download wherever you get, uh, wherever you subscribe to podcasts, particularly on the CCR Justice website. Hit up uh, Balsa about doing another thing. Tell us how much you liked or didn't like this at info at ccrjustice.org and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks everybody.